Welcome to my video entitled, How Data Can Be Misleading, The China Study. Hi, I'm Ken Ong, and I have experience working with medical data analytics. And I wanted to use these skills that were developed over time to really examine what the merits of Dr. Campbell's book, The China Study, was. There's a good debate going on. There's a great debate going on. And the debate is, should we be eating less meat? And if we are eating less meat, should we completely cut out meat altogether? Is that the best way to go? The vegans and the vegetarians, on the other hand, are saying yes. The answer to that debate is a definite yes. Okay, now we move to the China study. Now, the China study was a book published by T. Colin Campbell back in January of 2005. And what it was was a book that was loosely, and my, I remind you and emphasize the word loosely based on the China Cornell Oxford project, which was a, which was a 20 year study uh, that was uh, described by the New York Times, for example, as a Grand Prix of epidemiology. Uh, it was conducted by the Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine, and it was uh, a great study that was uh, conducted over 65 different counties in China. Now, Dr. Campbell, in this book, examined the relationship on the consumption of animal products, including dairy and various diseases, which included cancer, diabetes, heart disease, so on and so forth. Now, the conclusion that he came up with after writing the book and throughout the book was that meat was a causation of all these different diseases. Well, now you've got all these vegans, vegetarians, online in the media, on social media, demonizing meat. And so when you ask them, what is the scientific reasoning behind the demonization meat? They all inevitably point to the China study by Dr. Campbell. Okay, to the audience out there, I want to emphasize this point. We need to make a distinction between Dr. Campbell's China study book, which comprised 419 pages, of which only maybe one chapter, one chapter of those of that book was devoted to the data that was in the original China Cornell Oxford project, which is the book on the right, as you can see, which is huge. Now, carrying along a large book is not fashionable these days. Rather, what people want to do these days is they want to download information. If you want to get all the data from the original China Oxford Cornell study, you can go to this website and download all the data you want. It's quite amazing. Now, before we dig deeper into the China study, we first need to review a little bit about the fundamentals of statistics. This will be very helpful. Okay, the first and most important thing I want to get across to the audience is we have to understand the science of relationships, how things relate to one another. First of all, repeat after me. Correlation does not equal causation. Correlation does not equal causation. If there's one thing you take away from this video, I hope this is it. Okay, great. Let's talk about correlations masquerading as causation. So causation is an action or occurrence that can uh, cause one another. The result of an action is always predictable, providing a clear relationship between them, which can be established with certainty. Now, if you look here at the sun, and you look here at the ice cream and the sunburn issue, you're going to notice there's a difference between causation and correlation. Okay, now we've got another great, great example, correlation versus causation. Now, summer is coming up, and in the summertime, what happens is there's a noticeable increase in shark attacks. There is also a noticeable increase in ice cream consumption. The question you've got to ask yourself is, are they related? There's a correlation, definitely, but how are they related? Okay, what we have here is a great graph straight from Dr. Campbell's book. It actually um, is in the uh, first part of the book. And what it shows is a correlation, a relationship between colon cancer and meat consumption. And what this shows in this graph is that as the meat consumption increases, so does the colon cancer. Very interesting. But is it real? Now we have another graph, straight from healthyhacking.com. And what it does, it also shows a relationship between cancer. 
but this time it shows the relationship between breast cancers and internet users per 100 people. So what this graph shows is that as you increase the number of internet users, breast cancer also increases. Now that's a very interesting thing to examine, is it not? So the warning that I'm trying to send out to everybody is that sometimes correlations can masquerade as causation. And when you're looking at data, this is something we all have to be very careful about. Because uh, sometimes data can mislead us or the way data is presented can mislead us. And so this is a very important lesson that uh, I am trying to get across to the audience. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but what happens with an observational study is that it's supposed to be taken to a next step. For example, it could go and become a cross-sectional survey type of study, it could become part of a cohort study, or it could be used to do some, some, some type of case control or randomized experiments. All right. So observational studies are really the starting point. They create hypotheses. They do not demonstrate causality. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to the next exciting part of our video, misleading associations, cancer, cholesterol, and animal protein. The way that Dr. Campbell is able to demonize animal protein is through a set of correlations and a set of what I would call logical fallacies. It goes something like this. Cancer associates with cholesterol. Cholesterol associates with animal protein. And therefore, animal protein causes cancer. Okay, so let me describe what the problem with this whole uh, association is. Now, Campbell states that he and his research team found that one of the strongest predictors of diseases was blood cholesterol. And then he proceeds to treat cholesterol as a proxy for animal food consumption. And, and that, is, uh, that is one part of the problem. But because blood cholesterol can be affected by a number of non-dietary factors, because blood cholesterol can be affected by a number of non-dietary factors and can even rise and fall as the result of a disease, so basically examining the relationship between food itself and health outcomes is likely to be more informative than using cholesterol as a middleman. But the direct relationship between animal protein and disease isn't discussed in the China study or Campbell's China study. It is not discussed in the China study for one main reason. The relationship really does not exist in a statistically significant manner. Looking at the source data, what Dr. Campbell left out. All right, let's get, take a look at this data. Now, what I want to do is I want to first thank Denise Minger for publishing this on her website, and this is where I got the data from. Uh, but it's a great compilation of what is problematic with Dr. Campbell's analysis. So what this data basically shows is that if you take other data points from the actual large-scale China Oxford study that was done over 20 years, you will see other types of correlations. Yes, you will see positive correlations between animal protein and cancer. However, you will also find that there are negative correlations between animal protein and cancer. This is troubling. Again, taking a closer look at a broader data set from the original China study, we can now see relationships between plant protein intake and cancer correlations. Now, although there are many negative correlations between plant protein and cancer, we do find some troubling positive correlations between plant protein and cancer, such as stomach cancer, rectal cancer, colon cancer, leukemia, and so on down the line. Okay, so now you're going to start asking, well, what does this all mean? Well, basically what this shows, when you look at the broader data set, is that Dr. Campbell had cherry-picked certain types of data sets to include in his book to prove his point that meat causes cancer. But if you look at the broader data set, you're going to see that it's a lot more murky and that that type of conclusion that he has drawn is no longer valid. If you want to reach me via email, write to me at chinastudybusted at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can also turn to Facebook. I have a page there called Hacking Healthcare. So now we can start to look at the big picture. Okay, 
When you start looking at the big picture and start trying to see the relationship between cancers and the type of foods, with this particular data set that I'm showing you right now, which was taken from the original monograph of the China study, what you will find is that there is some sort of a correlation between animal protein and cancer and fish protein and cancer. However, you will also find that there is a correlation, a positive correlation between plant protein and cancer and also carbohydrates in cancer and also fiber in cancer. So if you look at again at the big data set and see the big picture, what you're going to find is that Dr. Campbell has unfortunately cherry-picked a lot of his data. Now we get to the interesting case about casein, the milk isolate. Okay, so now we move on to casein. So Dr. Campbell brings up the topic of casein in his book and it is featured rather prominently. First of all, let's start off with what is casein. So casein is a milk isolate. It is uh, something that you can derive from milk if you process it. And if you read his book, you will find that Dr. Campbell has cited a rather obscure study, unfortunately, a rather obscure study from a very obscure uh, medical journal that talked about how rats were given aflatoxin, which is a, a cancer-causing uh, chemical that comes from peanut butter that's moldy. So what this study found was that when rats were given 10 to 20 percent casein in their diet, they started to develop cancerous lesions or cancer. And this was um, set against rats that were not given this casein. And the rats that were not given this casein did not develop the cancer that the casein given rats had developed. And so the conclusion went like this. Casein seems to promote cancer growth in the rats according to this obscure study. And therefore, since casein is a milk isolate, which is an animal product, which is an animal protein, the conclusion was that all animal protein from every other sources also causes cancer or the growth of cancer or the promotion of cancer. Now there are many, many things wrong with this type of overgeneralization. And the first thing I want to address is that casein is a milk isolate, which is not found in nature. It is not a natural product. It has to be man-made. It has to go through various chemical stages of chemical processes in order to arrive at a casein uh, product. So the most problematic thing I, I find about this overgeneralization is that we're talking about casein, which is a milk isolate. And what casein does to rats tells us little about what traditionally consumed forms of milk will do to humans. And it tells us really uh, nothing that we can generalize to all animal nutrients. The other objection that I have stems from the fact that casein really is consumed as part of a whole food. Now when you consume a whole food, you are consuming all other chemicals, you are consuming all other fats, fatty acids, uh, carbohydrates, the whole mixture. Uh, taken as a whole. And when you look at it that way, an isolate uh, may not have an impact as compared to when it's completely outside of this realm. No clear answers on meat. Near the end of 2015, some friends told me that the WHO, which was part of the UN, came out with a report that said that meat causes cancer. More specifically, the report said that red meat causes cancer. This announcement was so worrying to many, including many in the media, that even the New York Times came out with a, a very scary article entitled, Meat is Linked to Higher Cancer Risk. The fear just abound. So suddenly, my vegan and vegetarian friends started going off about how the WHO and the UN are classifying meat as cancer-causing. Now, this got me thinking, so I started to look into the report online to see exactly what it said. When you start to dig into the details, you will find that the report didn't classify all meat. It only spoke about red meat and processed meat. And it was very clear in defining what was red meat. And it was very clear in defining what was processed meat. What the report left out was that it didn't say anything about chicken or fish. 
nothing, in fact. Looking at the report, there are some more clarifications that have to be made. Well, first of all, the report basically says that red meat and processed meat can cause cancer. But at the same time, it said that at the same time, red meat has nutritional value. And so it warns governments and international regulatory agencies to conduct risk assessment based on sort of a balancing of the risks. What the UN and WHO uh, did next was they published a set of question and answers uh, that were meant to help the public understand their findings better. And in one of the questions, it asked, should I stop eating meat? And the answer was that eating meat has known health benefits, meaning that eating meat has specific health benefits that the WHO recognizes. All right, so what did we learn from the WH study? Well, contrary to public hysteria in the media, if you look at the study in depth, what WHO was saying was that meat must be eaten less. Less meat is better. Less processed meat, less red meat. But it doesn't say get rid of meat altogether. It says that meat has nutritional value. That is the lesson. 20 years ago, the British Medical Journal, a very prestigious publication found in the UK, came out with a study that tracked 11,000 people, who were, uh, some of whom were vegetarians and some of whom who were health conscious uh, omnivores. So there was part of probably a 50-50 split almost. And it came out with some very interesting uh, findings. What the study showed was upon tracking 11,000 people who were both vegetarians and omnivores for up to 17 years, it studied their mortality rates amongst other things. And what it found out was that the mortality rate for vegetarians and vegans and omnivores were not that much different. Statistically speaking, there was not much of a difference. So another problem with most meat eaters versus non-meat eater studies is that the type of meat consumed is industrially raised or factory farmed meat. And uh, it's, got, it's full of antibiotics. It's full of all sorts of chemicals and things that are unnatural. So these population studies don't include people who ate only grass-fed meats without the hormones, pesticides, and antibiotics. So it's not just the meat in beef, but research shows that milk from grass-fed cows has more conjugated linoleic acid, CLA, than conventional milk. So CLA is a fatty acid found in dairy and beef and is linked to the protection from colorectal and breast cancers, diabetes, and heart disease. In fact, a 2010 study from the Harvard School of Public Health found that people with the highest levels of CLA in their body had a lower risk of heart attack than those with the lowest levels. Okay, I want to talk next about the Okinawan diet. The Okinawan diet is named after the, the largest island in the Roku Islands in Japan. Now, history buffs might recognize the name in the Battle of Okinawa, fought during World War II. But these days, there is another reason it's in the history books. Okinawa's people live a really, really, really long time. Now, the average life expectancy in the United States is about 78 years. In Japan, it's 84 years old. And five times as many people from Okinawa live to be 100 years as it peers compared to their peers in the rest of the country. Researchers have studied the Okinawa's residents for many years, and the answer lies a lot in the Okinawan diet. The reason I wanted to talk about the Okinawan diet is really simple. You know, in this video, I've taken you through a whole slew of statistics and presentations about data. But in the end, I think the simplest thing to do is to look at society that really has the longest living people and the healthiest living people, and that is Okinawa. And then find out, hey, what are they eating? The Okinawan diet really gets back to basics. It emphasizes a diet rich in yellow, orange, and green vegetables, which is very key. While they do eat rice, they don't eat so much of it. And another thing that's interesting, they skip on grains. So no gluten, no breads. And instead they eat something like a purple sweet potato. Now, 
They do include meat. They include some dairy and a lot of... So yes, it does include meat, including pork. And it includes dairy and some seafood. Well, actually a lot of seafood. But these meats are eaten in small amounts. And there is more of an emphasis on soy and legumes. So in conclusion, what we can say is that there is no definitive science out there whether meat is bad and vegetarians are better off. So what are we left with in the end? Well, what we're left with is a lot of conflicting scientific studies. But what I would recommend is that a diet must be catered towards the individual. Every individual is different. Some people some people may be better off as vegetarians and vegans, while others may need to get meat. It really depends on the person. It depends on their ethnicity, uh, it depends on their genetics, it depends on their race, it depends on their medical background. So there's just so many different factors out there that we have to consider. And we just cannot make sweeping generalizations that all meat is bad. Okay, so if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can certainly do so. Just uh, look up Hacking Healthcare and you could probably find my Facebook page which is dedicated to all things uh, of current medical interests, current medical studies and insights. If you want to reach me via email, write to me at chinastudybusted at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can also turn to Facebook. I have a page there called Hacking Healthcare.